Welcome to Barn Blog, and today we're talking to Alex, um, and we're talking about a specter hunting Brooklyn. Um, so we're going to be talking today about uh, Catherine Liu's PMC uh, pamphlet, Virtue Hoarders, as well as some of the uh, various theories around this and why it might be popular right now, and also why it might be, um, well, what's wrong with it? Problematic. Yeah, problematic. As, as the PMC would say. Um, you know, the, the, the most superficial observation that is sort of an ad hominem, but I think does apply, is that this does seem to be obsession, an obsession of people who would technically be in the category they're complaining about. Um, but I, I, that in and of itself is not actually a critique. Yeah, um, yeah, because that's like the oh, you live under capitalism, yet you complain, you know, post about socialism on your iPhone, whatever. Right. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's yeah. a real dumb response to the problem. But I do think that I do think there is something to that here, in so much that um, it seems to be kind of inspired partly by a shock of self recognition of one's role and then kind of ad hocing your way to a theory around it. Um, but a theory that I think as we talk about uh, can be perniciously used. And I also want to talk about why do you think Catherine Lou's the one form of this that, that uh, can get on Jacobin podcast and everything. Whereas all the other people promoting this theory are pretty much pariahs on the left. Really? I mean, I, you know, I don't, follow like the sort of a lot of the inner life drama but from what i understand she's been like roundly canceled and uh denounced um lately so yeah i don't know uh i, th I think it's more like you know there's and this has been a thing i would say since maybe i would say like the aftermath of uh Bernie's failed uh, 2016 run where like the Bernie left, the DSA left has two currents, uh, one being like the sort of, you know, they would call themselves intersectional Marxists or whatever. And the other one being the more sort of like class reductionists. And uh, they've sort of have their own, there's, there's a lot of overlap obviously because really we're talking about the same like 50 people in Brooklyn and elsewhere, but um, you know, the day uh, you can definitely see like the emergence of like two sort of uh, media ecosystems uh, around those two like brands, for example. Um, like, you know, it's like if someone you can kind of predict, like if someone has a positive opinion of Adolf Reed, then they'll probably also have a positive opinion of Angela Nagel and Catherine Liu. And like, uh, you know, there's these kind of constellations and then. Vice versa, it's like if someone is into, I don't know, like Sophie Lewis and um, like, you know, Commune Mag, RIP, and all that stuff. Like it's, um, so yeah, yeah I, I just, that's a big, big tangent, but I don't think she's has some kind of unique position. Like she just sort of falls on one side of that spectrum. I think it, what what I would say is interesting is I, I would agree that you shouldn't have a unique position. What I would say is the other places that have an explicit PMC thesis, such as the Bellows or whatever, are more shut out of the discourse. And frankly, Angela Nagel shut herself out. So we she's now more associated with that as well. Right. Um, and, you know, I have a history with Angela and, you know, I'm... I'm somewhat on a leash on talking about it, but, um, but it's, it, it's interesting because I would totally have said that list was all copacetic a few months ago, but what we have seen is in the quote post left milieu or whatever, you have people who aren't willing to go there. Um, Adolf Reed Jr. is definitely like, he thinks Nagel's crossed the line. Um, right. You know, yeah, you got called out for whatever. Like, right. It's just like I hate the fact that how much of this is like really un at underlying. It seems like it's like high school clicks more than like actual ideological uh, differences. Insofar as those even exist, 
um, among like all of these people. Because really, like, they're all social democrats, basically, right? Um, right. Yeah. I, I, and I think if you put people on the spectrum of where they are on social issues, you would have right, center, and left of the right wing of social democracy. Yeah. Um, and I would probably say Lou's actually in the center of that, not so much on the right. But to, in my mind, they're all rightist. So, like, you know. Um, I'm going to go I, from sin. <laughs> um, but when I say rightist, I mean on a spectrum of they're the right wing of the left or the right wing of the left of capital or whatever you want to frame it as. Um, so, you know, like that's that is not, you know, I think some of the tendencies that we accuse the right, the, the furthest right wing of this as being somehow radically different from the left wing of social democracy. Um, I think some of that's disingenuous and we'll, we might get into why, because I'm like, you're all structurally nationalist. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so, so critiquing the one side is almost like you're critiquing the side for saying some of the unpleasant stuff too loud. Exactly. Um, but when it comes to Catherine Liu, I found this book, but like I gave it a, a, an exact down the middle review because Part of it, I think, is actually insightful, and part of it, I think, is is such a mess that I don't know what to do with, and they coexist in the same little pamphlet. Um, and it's it's one of those things where, like, the class framing is kind of weird yeah. to me and a little bit incoherent. And also, like, she reads PMC thesis back on the people who don't actually have it. Um so who do you think she thinks the PMC is? Because she doesn't define her terms. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, this is okay. So like, you know, the classic criticism of like the, the PMC thesis that's often made by the sort of like, you know, um, you know, like, like this has become kind of a shibboleth in itself in that kind of divide that I'm talking about. Like people who say the word BMC derogatorily are associated with like, you know, the class reductionist or back left and the, how this always plays out there's like a script to this now and the sort of like intersectional left are like what are you talking about we're all aren't isn't anyone who owns the means of production a worker according to the marxist thesis like this bmc category just sounds incoherent like you're just com complaining about uh cultural issues and it's sort of like i think there's something disingenuous about that critique as well because mm -hmm. like on some level you know who they're talking about like we all know, like, and and we know that it, it, yes, like it, you can tease that out of a technical Marxist reading, but in some way, it's it's kind of ridiculous to say that, like you know, a I don't know, like an HR professional is a worker in the same way that a janitor is, right? Like that's that that just doesn't pass like the smell test. But like we do have to look deeper into that. Like what, like what is the PMC? How is it different from the petit bourgeois? And what, how does it, like, in what ways can it, over, like, does that sort of overlap with Marxist categories and in what ways it does it not, right? Like, that's kind of the question to me. Um, uh, I, well, the problem I, I have with it is we, it's like pornography, you know it when you see it. Yeah. But that's not really how class works. Right. And, like, this that actually, it, because I actually don't think outside of, well, even capitalists now, like who explicitly is a capitalist is almost like we're, we're now getting down to parsing, like how much of your income comes from the indirect ownership of capital. Um, so it, it's interesting. What I find interesting is, you know, to someone like me who I'm not that sympathetic to the to the uh, intersectional um social demo social democrats like um i'm i really find a lot of what they're doing i i remember the complaints launched that whole tempest in a teapot almost immediately after the bernie loss when you know adolf Reed jr gets like disinvited from a event by the philly right yeah. yeah 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 and by the afro socialist caucus who 
you know, it was funny because they were both calling each other liberals. And I was like, well, in some ways you both are. Yeah. So like, it's what you're grasping onto. You're both grasping onto actually different elements of the democratic party platform, interestingly enough. Um, but at the same token, I am worried about what the PMC thesis, because it's so vague, can hide. Mm -hmm. Both both from a left-wing perspective, um, I, I mentioned, and I've linked it in there, the Mike McNair review of Catherine Liu, and from the fact that there is a lot of right-wing class theory that even Barbara Ehrenreich, who was trying to revise it, picked up on and has brought back into the discourse that I don't even know that Lou is totally aware of. Like, you know, Lou is probably responding to the culture of academia and Berkeley, frankly. I mean, that's, you know, she's well, a film she, studies professor in Berkeley. <laughs> she actually does mention, like, in the very beginning, she goes through a list of, like, people who have tried to theorize the new class. Um, mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, it, like, she leaves out the large number of like right wing people who have done that, uh, like like she talked. Well, I mean, she talks about no, she does talk about. Um, sorry, that's that was wrong. Uh, she she mentions Herman Kahn, William F. Buckley, Newt Gingrich, David Brooks, and Tucker Carlson as uh, people who just like rant about the liberal elites, right? Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like I'm. It's interesting that she left out like Burnham, right? Because he was one of the prominent you know ex Trotskyists who then became a neocon, and he. He had the whole theory of the managerial class, which in many ways seems almost the same as uh, a lot of the PMC conversation. Except, except actually it's clearer on who they're like when you read Burnham, you know who he's talking about. Like there's a manage there's a managerial class for business, there's a managerial class for bureaucracy, and there's a managerial class for the military. And he actually predicts, not in the managerial revolution, but in a second book called The Machiavellians, or as it's now called, The Modern Machiavellians, um, which also betrays his softness for Italian fascism, by the way. <laughs> like People need to read, like, read who he cites as inspirations. Um, um, that, you know, he, he is very clear with, about who they are, all right? Um, there's also Peter Turchin, who is not really a right winger exactly, although, you know, I'm, I'm on another podcast and doing a long series on endnotes and, uh, and, uh, Clio dynamics and Peter Turchin's the prime Clio dynamics guy. And there are nationalist methodological assumptions in Clio dynamics. Um, but it's hard to say if they're, they're politically substantive, they're just, it's part of how you parse your data. Um, right. Because all the data is on a national level, right? Right. Yeah. Um, he has a theory of elites that also would would uh, define something like the PMC, because there would be P there would be professionals and managers in almost every category of society, and an elite of those. But um, and he has a theory of elite overproduction, which I know Angela Nagel has not not in Kill All Normies, but in the last since her particularly right as she turned really picked up on um but what i'll say about that is that uh that's not who these people are talking about explicitly i mean th there's this weird bait and switch and i don't and i see it in both lou and someone like malcolm swayuna who's a lot more sketchy um where sometimes the pmc is elite and sometimes the pmc is the 60 percent of people under 30 who have educational to have any sort of formal education beyond high school. And like, those are two, those are such really broadly different groups yeah. that it's like, I don't know who you're talking about. So in one sense, yeah, I know it when I see it. In another sense, no, I absolutely don't when I think right. about it. Yeah, so let's let's like break it down a bit because that's that, that part's really interesting to me, right? So like, for mm -hmm. example, uh, we all like, there, I think there's a core that like pretty much everyone will agree with in PFC, right? Like an HR manager, um, like, you know, a New York Times journalist, um, you know, a Robin DiAngelo type uh, diversity consultant, right? That's all like classic examples that we can all like, you know, rage against and hate together. Um, but, you know, then it gets more weird when you include groups like, say, um, a lot of times the list includes uh, lawyers, uh, bankers, 
teachers and nurses. And I think all of those are kind of problematic to problematic um, to include in the category of PMC for various reasons. So for example, let's say uh, lawyers and doctors, like those to me are closer to classic critique bourgeois. Like a lot of times, you know, they run private practices. They they have capital or at least like, you know, means some means of... Uh, they have capital and means and skills rents, right? Like we can yeah. we can expand that out a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and also like the credentials. I mean, this is something um, that uh, I've, like... I think is really correct that a mutual friend of ours has like really stressed like the the sort of guild like system in um, perpetuating and protecting uh, the value of credentials, which almost like um, are kind of their own type of capital. And I mean, the for doctors and lawyers like that that guild system has like largely remained intact even since like before pre capitalist times. Yeah. Um, the AMA has a long history that's almost medieval at its origin. <laughs> yeah, oh, and that was that was a part that I found really funny because uh, Lou mentions the AMA positively at one point because uh, here, let me find it. Yeah, um, you know she she has this narrative of like the the virtuous PMC in its progressive era when it helped like shape shape the post war compromise and then they like you know turned around and betrayed the working class. But for her, part of the the earlier is like uh, I'm going to quote here: uh, when the PMC sympathized with the plight of the masses of working people, it also pioneered professional standards of research grounded in professional organizations like the American Medical Association, the Association of University Professors. Uh, and all the professional organizations, da, da, da. Uh, in organizing professional life, the PMC tried to protect the integrity of specialists and experts against the power of capitalists in the markets. Like, no, they were they were trying to shore up the value of their own, like, you know, credentialed fiefdom. So it, it's odd to me that, like, you would see that as a example of a like, positive pro-worker, um, like, trend. Yeah, it, it was, it, including teachers and nurses is, is interesting. I will say that teachers as both li licensed and credentialed workers have a lot of protections that other, that like service workers don't have. That's totally true. Um, but they don't own their own capital. I cannot go and teach like and reproduce my own li limelinghood on my own as an individual teacher. There's almost no way to do that, um, particularly as a teacher, because I cannot grant, uh, you know, um, <laughs> of basically um, certified uh, uh, degrees on my own. Like I, I would have to be part of an accreditation system. Right. So, um, yeah, which is why the teach, like teach, you know, there's like, I think, I guess teachers unions exist in this how it kind of like, hybrid way because I, I think definitely like the right wing critique of teachers unions would say they're basically a guild right that protects seniority and whatever but they don't really have that power on their own they're like they're I would say maybe uh, the best of the most you could say is like they're a quasi guild like formation that still like has to they still have a power over them which is just you know the government and the public or the public school system it, like teachers like teachers unions do not run like the school system right uh, yeah so yeah um I've, we've been at the old marxian category of labor aristocracy and division of mental and physical labor seems to cover this in a way that doesn't come up out as a conspiracy right. theory i completely agree and that's the other thing about this pmc stuff like i know what aaron reich was trying to do in the 80s when she was talking about like she was actually trying to respond to these theories in the 60s that christopher lash was lambasting about the new class of students and student professionals because of the expansion of education into formerly working class children. Um, what I find interesting and 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 true in, in uh, Lou, but it also shows up at how messed up the, her categorizations are, um, is that when you when you look at um, credentialing and the, the spread of credentialing, it's happened largely with the end of the post-war social compact, right? Um, Mike McNair points this out in his critique of the book that like Lou really has a like a hard on for Fordism, basically, yeah. and seems to think Fordism is some kind of socialism, which is weird. Yeah, I mean they all do. Like this is like that that whole like 
segment of the sort of like class reduction, the workerist, whatever class reduction is. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's their kind of thing that like they, you know, the nostalgia for like the post-war uh, labor compromise, whether it's in the U.S. or uh, elsewhere in the West. And they, they, the, the, the constant through line seems to be that like there's, a, there's like a, a big like lack of materialism in the sense of like why that ended, right? It, it's almost like it, 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 the narrative is often seems to ascribe this agency to like Oh, the, the left or the, the new left or the PMC betrayed the working class or they, they decide or Reagan came along and just destroyed Reagan Thatcher just came along and destroyed, uh, you know, this like awesome system that we had or, uh, you know, people started focusing too much on individualism or on identity. And they like it almost no one ever mentions like, you know, the crisis of the seventies, the falling rate of profit. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, or or the fact that the post-war pack in Europe and America was literally because of the destruction of worldwide capital to the point that like 98% of the world, not, not 98, 48% of the world's capital was in, it was in U.S. hands just by fact of it being the last capital standing. Right. Like it's, you know, um, it's, it's something that I think is completely skipped over in these analyses. But unfortunately, the people fighting these PMC people share that assumption that like neoliberalism was a political po project, which it was, I'm, I'm actually, it was, but it was a political project emergent from conditions that like, there was a reason why the labor governments were neoliberalizing um, and, and Jimmy Carter was neoliberalizing before Reagan and, Reagan and Thatcher. Yeah. And, you know, I always laugh because I always talk about my realization of this. It was like a, was um, when I was 28 years old and reading Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine, and she goes through about like how all the the left, the center left governments neoliberalized, and she she seems to think it's a conspiracy by like you know the Rand Corporation or something. And and when I I just realized by like no, it's well, because Keynesianism has a natural limit, and you hit it. Like, um. So it's it, it's interesting how this there's like a nostalgia, and I've noticed this in the left before the Bernie turn, actually, that there's been a nostalgia for the late for the late forties, early fifties. It's completely, you know, I mean, you even see it in the FDR people who ignore what FDR actually did. Sometimes you like see them project great society programs like back into the thirties. It's just right. it's it's bizarre. Um, so yeah, it's. It's my favorite, uh, my favorite mm -hmm. quote uh, by that. Uh, I think it was a libertarian guy, Brink Lindsay. It's like, you know, both the left and right uh, pine for the 1950s. Uh, the right wants to go home there, and the left wants to go to work there. Yeah. Right. Um. So, and it is also interesting that the period of time that they, somebody else brought this up in the chat. The period of time that like Lou is idolizing is probably one of the most management intensive times which is why there was both a left and right managerial like it wasn't just burnham like um basically uh frederick pollock of the frankfurt school thought that a sim like there was a managerial class emerging from the from monopoly capital basically that capital had been largely monopolized there had been a fortist detente with the state to avert crisis and he proved you know they both kind of infinitely projected this into the future um, and of course the declining rates of profits of the seventies happened. I know there are people who will, who will deny that, or they'll say it's completely contingent on the oil shock. Um, but if all it takes is one commodity shock to bring everything to negative profitability, things are already trending downward. Um, so. Uh, but but this is interesting too, though, because Lou goes back and she talks about the progressive PMC. She also talks about the people complaining about it in the eighties. Um, she doesn't mention some of the more thought out right wing, uh, not just Burnham. There's also Sam Francis and uh, and uh, Yavin Curtis, aka Minchus Molbug, who both have actually more coherent versions of the PMC thesis than this. Um, 
And then Michael Lynn is not a PMC -er, but he's associated with, with a lot of these guys. He's, you know, he's probably giving you money. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's a little dig there. <laughs> um, no actually kidding. though, you know, it's interesting because people always like, Oh, it's the best right wing conspiracy. And I'm like, no, American affairs just pays way more than Jacobin. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, and it's easier for right-wing magazines to do that. Because to reasons. some degree, although Jacobin's not poor. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I mean, maybe maybe, maybe it does have a lower profit margin than I realize. I don't know. But I feel like Jacobin is not an underfunded magazine for a left-wing one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, like, I guess, so, you know, all these attempts to theorize a new class, like, and the thing is that, you know, Marx, Marxism is not the only framework in which the concept of class and the word class is used, right? And I think that's kind of what's behind a lot of the confusion. You know, even, you know, like Tucker Carlson will talk about the working class. Uh, liberals talk about class. Yeah, they just all mean something different. Like, yeah. And, and yeah. so the question is really like, why, what is, what is the purpose of uh, your defining a particular class? And, you know, if it's just a cultural critique of like, oh, like, these people in these jobs uh, share a set of like, you know, cultural attitudes and consumption habits, uh, which is like, you know, that's a David Brooks kind of uh, critique. That's, that's fine as like a cultural critique. Right. But if you're trying to situate in the, the, the Marxist, the, the reason for like defining class in a Marxist sense is to, you know, what is to be done, right. You, you define a class and then you decide it because that is the class that has a particular relationship to the means of production that can then accomplish something politically via that relationship to the means of production. So, right. and, and that, that's the key. And if, if your class category is not defined by the relationship to the means of production, then, you know, it, it's not, it's not like necessarily wrong or completely useless. It's just not politically useful in a Marxist sense. Right. Well, I mean, this is why, like, I actually am a lot less annoyed by people like Michael Lind or um, people who are who are Weberians or whatever, like uh, traditional liberal class theorists um, who are who are talking about this because I know they mean something different. Their operant definition of class is is different than mine, right. um, and I can actually I can actually have a framework where I can overlay a Marxist class theory about the primary general conflict of capital with the experience of classes. But I still think the PMC thesis is weird because it's, it's so broad that, I mean, particularly when you're talking about teachers, like Lou can't, like even that book, both teachers and the, you have this heroic role of doctors, but you also have the thing about teachers where like she's defending public schools at one point And I'm like, well, but why? Right. Like, 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 you know, I mean, I, I, I know why I would defend it, not just because, you know, but like from the from the standpoint of of labor and PMC growth, like if you think teachers are part of the PMC, that's the biggest PMC employer there is. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, no, no one has done more to break the power of the PMC than the right wing uh, gutting teachers unions. Right. Right. I mean, it's just like if that's what you think the the issue is, then like. Why are you siding with like that's what I couldn't I couldn't tell. And my, my very first question is like part of why I think Lou is a little bit more acceptable to the Jacobin crowd, even if she's on the right wing of it and is getting canceled by a large by the other half, it's because like she still sees she's it's because she's inconsistent in a way that valorizes things that are traditionally part of the old Democratic Party progressive left platform, right. it kind of cuts them an out that doesn't actually make sense if you were consistent with the class theory that she had. Right. The other thing I'm interested in is because we've been talking about like the groups that are, you know, nurses is another thing. That's like, um, you know, that, that to me is like, does not, that's like one of these things is not like the other. Um, like I had a friend who used to work with the SEIU and was like organizing nurses and that was like one of the most, from the stories he told me, that was like one of the most un-PMC environments ever. It was like walking into a room of like pretty much like, like you know, working class, like black and Hispanic women just like making the most un-PC comments and laughing about it. And uh, Teachers are a lot less PC too than, than, uh, 
then it, the PMC thesis would have let people believe. I can yeah. I can tell you, and including the teachers union, like so it's it's one of those things where there actually is a difference between the the national level representatives and most people's day to day experience of the teachers union. Right. Um, I mean, like every teacher I know wants to increase diversity, uh, you know, diversity success because they want their students to be successful and increasingly their students are diversified. But most of them are not like, you know, counseling people on Twitter. Like it's not, it's like it's not something they care about for the most part. Um, but uh, I wanted to say like, so we're talking about the groups that are included in the PMC category, but it's also uh, very telling like which groups are excluded, right? Because the reason we don't say petit bourgeois is because presumably it's it's consciously, it's conspicuously not including people like, well, take like the capital riots, right? And you read the profiles of some of the people who came out, it's like, oh, like uh, so-and-so owns a pool supply business in Bumblefuck, Florida, right? It's like, oh, can I curse on here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cool. Um, uh, right, right. And because and yeah, a lot of people, all the people, that, that Russ like said, oh, this was a working class uprising. Like, no, these are like, this is like, you know, dude who owns a landscaping business, woman who owns a pool supply store. Um, like, it's classic petite bourgeois, and it makes sense why they have the sort of politics they do. But um, what distinguishes them from DMC, right? That's that's the interesting question because in a in a set in a in a purely Marxist sense, they're both pretty bourgeois. But well, yeah, I mean, some of the it, this is this is where it's interesting. I, like, so from like even when we talk about doctors and and lawyers, like doctors and lawyers would probably be 50 50 petite bourgeois, 50 50 labor aristocracy, frankly, because some of them are employees and some of them aren't. Um, and there is a real way where there's an elephant in the room in this class analysis that the PMC stuff hints at but avoids, and that is the expansion of skills rents and rentier classes. But okay, but if we include those people, like people who can collect skills rents and have credentialed or licensure, not only do you have a lot of petite bourgeois in there, but you also have a whole lot of people who are blue collar, um, city city bus drivers. Uh, mail carriers, licensed electricians, licensed plumbers, and I'm not, you know, we're not even talking about people who are who are private who are in private um, businesses, even if they're employees. Licensed service sector in it, licensed food service people, yeah. like, like, then right. the then if you if you if you count licensure and skills rents and as part of your compensation, um, into what defines you as PMC. There is almost nobody who isn't PMC, <laughs> right. including a lot of blue collar people. So it does feel like this is just a, a nice way of saying white collar, you know, culturally versus blue collar culturally. Yeah, um, I think one of the sort of ways to like make that a little more accurate and narrow it down is uh, the idea of, you know, class isn't just a moment a momentary instantaneous snapshot of like how things are at the present it's class is intergenerational it reproduces itself which a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of whose book does deal with like the bmc has children so the, but it, right, i will say that but i'll push back on that a little bit some of these pmc people also define they deny class mobility entirely which mm -hmm. is weird uh michael lynn is the one who actually makes this most explicit lynn says that when he defines the, the overclass, and he actually includes petite bourgeois in the overclass, he's got this weird, it's not weird, it's actually somewhat clarifying. He has like capitalist and our rulers, like as almost absent from the game entirely as like above everybody, but they're not involved. And then there is like managers, um, professionals, and petite bourgeois, and the professionals and the petite bourgeois are actually at odds with each other. And the working class and the capitalist and, and actually in Lynn's geopolitics are pretty much non-existent entities that just pick a side. Um, so. 
So the are the are the professionals analogous to the kind of PMC that? Uh, yeah, they are. Except Lou, I mean, except um, more than Lou, Lynn actually does define them in a way that can kind of make sense. He defines professionals as people who have a relationship to the state through credentialing or through explicit employment by the state. Um, so he's, he, he sees them, you know, he sees them as, uh, um, as kind of a class for itself because it has a relationship to the state explicitly. And I, I think that's a little bit more defensive, although there's a couple of things from a Marxist perspective, it treats, and this is implied in a lot of these PMC people's actual politics. It treats the working class as something like you appeal to, but you only appeal to it to tie it up to one of the different elite sectors of society. Yeah. Which, I mean, to be fair, that is kind of what it has been, you know, the working class mm -hmm. political engagement is like historically low. I think that one of the, I think even before I like got into Marxism, my like, this is like what I thought was really brilliant political analysis at like 19. But you remember that game Primal Rage where mm -hmm. it's like the big dinosaurs fighting each other. And then there's like the little people that are, uh, you know, clamoring around them. And you can, they like, they flock either to one or the other. And you can, some, you can pick them up and eat them for health. And yeah. like that, that seemed to be the model of like politics, basically. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, I think that model of politics is true and working class demobilization and demobilized time. But what's been a weird bait and switch with these post Bernie people is one, they seem to have a vision that like we had a massive working class movement in the United States in 2015, um, you know, full, full of socialist workers, which is hilarious to me as a projection upon the recent past. We haven't had a massive working class movement in the United States since the thirties. And really, we haven't had one that's been self-organized since the teens. Like, basically, Woodrow Wilson to Woodrow Wilson to FDR killed it. Like, killed it dead. So, yeah, it's... Uh, they killed it dead to create that labor compromise that uh, right. that Bernie Kratz loved so much. Like, right, that but, yeah. compromise was built on, like, the grave of a working class movement. And it's hilarious to me that so many of these people like Christopher Lash, because Christopher Lash's first three books is all about this, how like the 1930s was a betrayal of the socialist movement. The socialist movement betrayed itself um, out of desperation. Um, that there was a Brahmin class, he specifically uses that, of like old land aristocracy, you know, of the yeoman establishers of the country, of which of which both Roosevelt's were uh, out of and Wilson was out of as well. They're remnants of um, the Northern, the Northern, uh, you know, farmer aristocrats and the Southern planters. Um, and that they were dying and they knew they were dying. And so they stole a bunch of ideas from the populist and socialist movement to, to build a more cohesive set of capitalism. And it worked for about 40 years and it started, and like when when Lash is writing, it's starting to die. Like he's seeing it begin to die down, and he sees the new left as a result of that, right? Um, and so it's very weird watching people go back and read this PMC stuff into him when they're celebrating the period of of left development that Lash sees as like, well, that's actually where the betrayal happened, you know, like. Like the you, you, like the American left has been dead since like the nineteen from last from like nineteen twenty one forward, like um it it has not been independent, and um where Lash is similar to the PMC people is he does see sectional interest in the development of he does call them classes but he doesn't mean it in the Marxist sense of like insulated areas of economics academia and bureaucracy that have interests, but he doesn't actually equate those interests. Like he actually sees them as separate. Um, and so like when we talk about this PMC stuff, yeah, there are sectional interests, which I think this does really describe. But I also think like Mag Manier is not, not wrong in the fact that if you were to look at like, at, you know, by these people's definition of working class, whatever that is, because they actually don't say, 
Um, you will find the two ideologies that are fighting in the working class as ideologies. So he, so like what 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 uh, Mike McNair says is this is actually just a you know it's a cultural development in capitalism that we're hiding behind a class theory. You know, yeah. um, which which so. is like that's what I've said about like the whole like yeah like the the stupid poll left mm -hmm. like. It, they're funny and they're often correct, but it's it's a cult. It's uh, you know it's a satire. It's a it's an accurate cultural satire, but it's not something to like. That's actually a basis for like a materialist left politics. And let's be honest, some of what they're correct about is often like two steps away from. I mean, it's 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 really. I find it really hard to talk about this because I am a a former rightist and b I you would definitely be slurred by intersectionalists as a class reductionist. Um, although I've always my, my answer to that has always been like, well, they're not class reductionist enough. Like that's part of the problem. Um, <laughs> um, like if you get super class reductionist, you start seeing racial and gender stuff reemerge. So. Yep. And the family, like that. right. Yeah. So, like, it's just you know how I get there. It's just like let's go all class all the time, and then um, you do deep historical dives. But what I find really frustrating with with um, with this is like the PMC stuff is hitting on something. It, it is hitting on something, but it's also adjacent to a lot of really ugly right wing thought that is also trying to frankly, opportunistically take advantage of those same things. And this isn't new. Christopher Lash was writing about this in the six, in the 70s when when people were, when um, conservatives were actually trying to appropriate him. I remember McNair kind of blames him for this. And Lash was always talking about like, well, the conservatives have figured out a way to seize on real working class problems and lie about them. And the left just d pretends they don't exist altogether. Um, like he talks about, like the left says there's no problem in education, and there clearly is. Like the left says, like, um, like uh, uh, women entering the workforce has been has been progressive, and Lash is like, well, yeah, but it was also used as a way to lower wages for everybody. Like, so it's it's one of those things where where there is, there is this real tension and both the answers here don't really get to the problem. And there's another thing, like I do think another elephant in the room is the increasing importance of rentier economic relations. Um, and rentier economic relations uh, are, are more and more important. And the unfortunately, the only person I know who's really writing about this is someone whose politics I also don't like. Um, and that's and that's Jody Dean, because um, she sees this as like she sees the declining array for profits leading to economic policies that she sees as rentier driven and largely quasi feudal. Right. Yeah, it's neo feudalism. Right. Which kind of implies that like what we call capitalism was actually just like this unstable transitional system that either had to resolve itself into socialism or ends up collapsing back into um, feudalism. I, I sometimes that. flirt with that idea because of this, because of the weird. So I have this obsession with late antiquity. So for people who know, know what I mean by that, the end of the Roman empire to like year 1100. Um, and so medieval late antiquity. And in the beginning of that time period, you actually do see most of the things you would need for capitalism to develop. You have development of something like banking. You have stabilized currency between world trade. You have um, you have you have people getting paid um, in a currency beyond just soldiers. Um, and from a mixture of a thousand reasons, there's not a singular reason that all falls apart, and you get and you get stuck on these manorial estates that basically go from private land holdings into quasi governments. Um, there is a way in which like a crisis of capitalism could regress to that. And, and as regressions, that's actually one of your luckier stasis given 
given the state of uh, climate and everything, you know, some of the regressions from capitalism is just we all die. Um, so, um, but it's it's interesting, right? Because in the in the in the early period of socialism, no one would have even considered that as a possibility. Like regression that far back wouldn't have been seen as as a thing. Um, I'm not so sure that rentier stuff truly is feudalism because there's some a lot of things about feudalism that we don't have. But it also, if if we're really in a rentier economy, it's not capitalist anymore either because like um, commodity values and growth start to just die. And like you have basically a, 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 a hyper low growth economy, like yeah. um, about 1%, well, I think. Well, I think what we're in right now is this sort of, it's almost like a collective, it's a collective agreed denial where um, there's this supposed illusion hangout that growth will be restored at some point. And but what we're doing now is just uh, creating options upon options upon options and trading those as assets for some kind of hypothetical future growth to be realized, which never actually will be realized, but as long as like, as long as everyone uh, believes in the value of the hypothetical future value of those assets, we can just keep putting options on them, which is of course what happened in that, in that fell apart in 2008. But like the, you know, 2008 will keep happening as long as that's what the basis of the economy is. Like the, the my favorite thing I saw uh, maybe like a year or two ago was that, um, to like finance the construction of new public housing, New York was like uh, experimenting with the system where like private landlords could invest um, in public housing by claiming the public housing tenants as uh, as assets. So it's like you have this. It's like Google's dead souls. Like you have this many. You have this many souls. Uh, now these are counted as assets you can borrow, you can leverage to borrow more. Because hypothetically, you'll at some point be able to co uh, collect higher rent from these people, even if even if like the majority of them are actually delinquent in rent and have like no assets with which to pay rent. But you know, as long as you can leverage them as assets and count them in your log. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, you know, and you can see the similarities to feudalism there, obviously. Right. It's one of, it, this is one of my hidden critiques of MMT people, um, is I'm always like, yeah, you're describing the way the monet monetary system in a developed country works. Yes, that it has worked in empires in the past where you had no real commodities attached. And yes, you're right that barter isn't where commodities came from. I mean, where, where money, where currency comes from, excuse me, is where commodities come from. But, um, uh, where you're wrong is that you can just have an economy based solely off that and it and it grow at all. Um, what I find interesting, if you look at the rentier economies right now, they are still also, despite the fact that very few people are employed in that productive sector, the largest producers of material commodities on the planet. That's China, that's the United States, that's Europe as a block. Um you know, and when that goes away, what happens? You know, this has been one of my, my my backdoor things where I'm like, okay, you know, MMT people, if you want this as a worldwide policy, I, I'll grant it to you, but you have to figure out a way to where you have international cooperation and currency sovereignty and it not be the EU everywhere in the world. And, <laughs> and like, I get like, I get a lot of like, well, we need to, we need to think about that. And I'm like, well, you do. Um, and if you really think about that, I'll take you seriously. But right now, it looks to me that that's how we're developing is like, but these commodities are going to nothing. And it's really funny when you try to get people to to look at this. You know, you, you'll, you'll look at Maduro's Venezuela, which, you know, is a, is a mess. And you'll have two things that are blamed. Sanctions. Okay. Well, when you're blaming sanctions, what you're saying is an autarkic economy doesn't work. Okay, uh, like, duh. And right. two, um, uh, the other thing they'll blame is pegging the money to the dollar. What else are they going to peg it to? 
And if they pegged it to another currency that was equally strong, let's say it's the Chinese yuan, a yuan, it's gonna or the RMB, it's gonna do the same thing. Right. Or like, yeah, it's gonna be just it's gonna hyperinflate and no one's gonna accept it. Right. Um which is and if people who get on me like, oh, there's no such thing as, se as secular stagnation and and the, the and the tendency of the declining rate of profits to fall, which by the way is not an absolute law. Like like Marxism does have countervailing the uh, tendencies on on profits. Like you can do things to get your profits temporarily back up. Um, like have a world war. Yeah, yeah, destroy a bunch of capital either through war yeah. or or letting all the liquid paper assets deplete or I don't know. A pandemic that actually kills a bunch of people. I mean, like, uh, like all these things. Um, they're all bad, by the way. But all these things can get rid of the overproduction crisis, right? Um, but it, it, this is like to me, the PMC thesis is a way to avoid this because this is not pretty. And if you also don't assume, if you're not in a an immiseration thesis, you don't assume that the working class is automatically going to just all become communist overnight because things are bad. Um, you have to look at the future with a certain amount of like, there's a lot of possibility, but most of the possibility is kind of not good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so like, yeah, like what can we rescue from the, the PMC thesis? Like what, it, what is like a, if we apply like, more rigorous Marxist analysis to this, like in terms of the relationship to the means of production, like I, what what's left? I do think you have a privileged section of the of the working class. Let's call it labor aristocracy. That term has also been kind of ruined by Maoists. So many terms have been ruined by Maoists, redefining everything ad hoc. But whatever. Um, you have a labor aristocracy that. Is is being precariatized um, or proletarianized? Uh, either one, you can use either word. They pretty much mean the same thing in this context. Um, that, but does have relative amounts of social safety to care about cultural concerns, which may even be good things. Like I don't think all the things that the quote PMC care about are bad. In fact, the only conservative critique that I tend to take seriously. Is that the PMC, if it, you know, that this labor aristocratic class of liberal ideologies, right? Um, that they very much have a uh, do as I say, not as I do attitude towards some of these things. Um, and I do mean like, we'll diversify like higher education. Um, but we won't, uh, you know, we won't push against credentialing as a trend. Um, we will talk about the need for um, diversified communities or, or, or even like, actually, what the, one of the things is like, one of the most more pernicious ones is the way um, genderfication arguments tend to be picked up by PMC people. And ignoring the fact if a, if a neighborhood doesn't gentrify, it becomes a shithole. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I come from a city that did not gentrify. And, like, the black people eventually left, too, because it's a shitty place to live. Like, no, no one wants to live there. And that's a condition of capitalism that you just, you know, it's a way of not looking at what's causing the primary problems. I mean, I remember... My favorite one right now, the, the that like if you want to look at like liberal discourses, is like um, the whole like non-white right racism or anti-blackness driving ethno-centric developments. And I'm like, this is ethnic enclaves under capital, people competing for resources and block groups. This is inevitable. It does. It does not. It would happen even if white people weren't involved. Like. Yeah. Um, and does so yeah. like explaining it totally in terms of like of whiteness is both fair. That's how it developed historically, and 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 the Anglo-speaking settler oh, colonial. Oh, you, you forget there's multiracial whiteness now. That was right, the... exactly. And it's just like I don't think those people are adopting whiteness. I think they're petit bourgeois. Like, yeah. and um, but I wonder if there is something to like. 
it's the the managerial part of it that's interesting to me because um i do the, the hr stuff the yeah the, and it's going to be leveraged as an hr weapon is interesting right it's to me it's people who work in who through their work somehow uh shape the way that management happens uh so it's not we're and in so we're not necessarily actually talking about like you know a floor manager on a factory no that's, that's not the pmc but the both the HR professional and like the sociologists who does research that then, you know, gets cited in a white paper for like HR best practices. Um, or, you know, the, the academics who develop some like terms that then, uh, you know, get added, get, you know, added to like one of the government regulations about like equal opportunity or something. Um, like that, that almost seems to me to be some kind of, uh, coherent category that you could possibly do something with. I, I, I think I think as a sectional interest of capital. And here's another thing: like Marxists have gotten really lazy on doing sectional uh, sectional um, uh, class analysis. Are like their intersections are always just like okay, race, gender, um, maybe religion. If we want to do something about Islamophobia, I guess. Although we don't really want religion to exist, but we're going to keep that quiet. Right. Um, you know those kind of things. Um, I would say that looking at sectional interest is something that a lot of these people do very shittily. Um, these people being people both doing the work, like the, these these um, people managers, this 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 kind of management, like management sector of capital, right? Um, um, a kind of technocratic management sector. There are there are a way in which some of the groups, like nurses and and nurses is a weird one though. Like nurses and teachers are are so liminal to this space. Um, they are technically involved in the management of huge populations and like what you would call like civic engineering, but they're the lowest form of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's basically in a yeah difficulty and uh... yeah. Um, so I mean. I guess what I would say is there does seem to be an increasing need due to the complexity of society for there to be a certain group of people who does manage all this, who are not owners and who really kind of aren't totally speaking. Well, they are workers, but they're, but, but they're so elite within the work, within the worker spectrum. Um, are there petite bourgeois? Like, Right. And they kind of have a specific grift. And the thing is, though, you can't generalize to either professionals or the petite bourgeois about the specific class of people. It would actually probably be like one percent of the population that's actually in this. Um, yeah. So like management consultants, um, HR uh, and people who media. do research for applied sociology. <laughs> like yeah. Media, though, like that. I mean that counts, I guess. Media is weird. Um, media, media has thrown me actually for a long time. Like, okay, you and I are part. Well, you not directly, but I'm part of the busker economy, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, uh, the it's weird hearing th this be classed as PMC though, because I'm like, no, this is clearly petite bourgeois, and we have no power, right. like. <laughs> Like I do not like I have less social power as a podcaster, even though I have a lot more clout than I do as a teacher. Like, um, yeah, it's 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 interesting where the media would fall into this. Um, it's also it makes sense to me though why the people who are obsessed with this tend to be people. Um, who are in those areas. Like, if, if you look at people who are who are railing against the PMC, it does seem to be people who, by and large, if they use this terminology for this fight, this fight exists all across capital, right? But this fight being phrased this way, are people in academia largely who are tied to the social democratic left who maybe want to blame wokeness or whatever for their for their problems um people who uh 
are responding to management, but are it and people who are in the media sphere, like there's a lot of people in the media sphere obsessed with this. Um, right. yeah. And I, I guess it's the shock of recognition that you're labor aristocracy, like, and that your weird cultural shit is distracting from stuff. But what do you do? You just rebrand that same weird cultural shit as a new theory, and you don't really look at what's driving it beyond. Like, why do we care about media so much? Right. Like, and I mean, there's a there's a deeper thing because that that's almost that almost gets to like a Freudian analysis of like the the PMC who a PMC right because there's there's a weird sort of um, you know again like like we start like we said in the beginning it's not like oh well you're PMC but you're critiquing PMC it's it, it, there's something deeper to that because it's integral to the whole thing because uh, part of the critique is that PMC have a different set of class interests uh, than the working class and they've acted to shore up those class interests and to advance themselves at the cost of the working class right and then that does raise the question of like, well, okay, what do you, as a PMC, what interest do you have in calling this out? And then, mm -hmm. you know, the the sort of like uncharitable explanation is like, this split is actually just the the less successful PMC versus the successful ones, right? Um, but like, I, I think there's, I don't think that's entirely fair. I think there's something more to that, but like you, you need some, you need, because like if you're, if you're pretending to do like Marxist class analysis and you're talking about class interests, then you can't just default to like, well, I guess some PMC just have a conscience and they're good PMC and most of the PMC don't and they're bad PMC. Like you need something more than that. I mean, and there, there is, a, there is a way in which like when some of these people say in PMC, it's replaced elites with the triple, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, because that's what San Francis was talking about. Like San Francis was talking about a bunch of media elites who have been led by, by newly arrived immigrants who are highly skilled. And by that, he meant Jews and Chinese people. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that you needed a counter PMC that was meaner, um, that was willing to play a game of white nationalism, even though even though Francis thought that white nationalism was a doomed project, to you know fight against this parasitic elite, right? Um, what worries me about the PMC discourse is like the parts of it, it true hide these other parts of it, and some of it's some of it's like malice crap. <laughs> Like even like you know, I think Matt Manier's not wrong about that. Like you just invent a class to deal with the you're part of your left nation building project. You don't want to that's not copacetic to what you want. Um, and you start you make the generational nature of social reproduction of class a caste demarcation. This is this is actually interesting because a lot of people who claim to be anti PMC and then are of it of it. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm using this because we're, we're using their terms right now, um, will claim that they're not somehow because of their class origins, even though I guess they mean that they have, I mean, and, and this is what I said when I was talking about Lynn making explicit. Lynn says that it takes two generations for class mobility to happen. You are automatically and always a class of your parents, no matter what. Right. Because class is a cultural association. Right. But your children will not necessarily be. Right. Right. So class mobility, like you, if you move up in class mobility, you are still of the class you were born in and your kids are not, which is sort of, it is sort of casty. Um, whereas I, you know, I can tell you from my own personal experience, having moved up from like, <laughs> um, I mean, like, I saw my mom go from non-PMC, waitress who kept it, like, you know, I lived in a car at one point in my life, um, to to nurse. Some of the changes of cultural values was, like, really quick. Um, you know, you just, it didn't take that long. And my mom wasn't, an, like, it, uh, certain working class things don't also go away overnight. They don't. But, like, the idea that, like, Jack Vance, for example, not Jack Vance, J.D. Vance, I think that completion all the time right jd vance is uh is somehow um still working class virginia and is that's laughable to me like i i don't have 
you know, I might be working class in the vague sense that like I earn a wage, but I don't have the same habitus as like when my mom was a waitress and my stepdad was a mechanic. Like there's, it's a completely different world. Um, but I, I do know that, yes, I mean, like, like for example, I, w- I just shared a, a Yale study that says, like, employers subconsciously uh, discriminate on class origins and know from, like, two sentences um, your likely class origins unless you have really practiced to mask it. Um, and they discriminate on that more than probably anything else in hiring. Yeah. Um, like the, I mean... <laughs> There was that story about the Silicon Valley, uh, like uh, Indian Americans uh, facing caste discrimination in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley because there are so many Indian Americans working there that like they recognize each other's caste from their like last name or whatever. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, and I think like you can't. This is why, like, I always talk about like you have to like I think you have to have like three or four theories of class because Marxism explains what's going on in the broad spectrum of things but i don't think like most people don't experience the world actually as capitalists versus workers in that immediate way um in a way that's clear most people don't know who the capitalists are like really they don't like like what is it 75 percent of all assets is owned by five percent of the world's population and they're so removed you do not know who most of them are yeah, they like, all did, like you know, uh, shell companies within shell companies or within shell companies. Right. The real bourgeoisie is like, I mean, I don't want this almost does make me sound like a conspiracy, but it has learned to hide itself yeah. structurally. Like, um, so it's it's something that I don't know. I, I do think sometimes there are there are there are sort of everybody. A mutual friend of mine, I think Ben Burgess is kind of like this. It's like everybody who who's ever earned a wage should automatically be all in it together. Um, you know, uh, united colors of Benetton socialism. Um, and by that, I mean like, like you're all wage earners from from like half the doctors all the way down to the poorest like uh, shit slinger who's off the books at. Uh, at some loading dock somewhere. Um, And I'm like, yeah, but (laughs) that's so broad. Most people don't experience class distinctions that way at all. Like, like their habitat, like I am going to use like a Badurian language here. Their habitats are so different, you know? And so, you know, I've been talking about like class nominalism. Like I do think Marx's class analysis is objective. But when we talk about these other divisions, we kind of have to we kind of have to be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna take a different class theory and superimpose it on Marxism so that we can talk about these other things so that maybe we can solve this problem. And my other critique of the PMC thesis is what what would you solve if you fight against the PMC? I'll give you I'll give you a good example of a policy. Like you always see like Amy Therese raging against like the forgiveness of student loans no we said her name yeah i know (laughs) um it's i feel like it's like saying candy man into a mirror Um, but (laughs) um but uh um there is a sense in like yes the, the the upper middle class of uh, of cap of capital strata would benefit more from student loan forgiveness than poor workers. All right. However, if you look at the if you if you also look at this generation generationally and and break down the aggregate stats according to the generation, um, the the people who the people who uh, by and large the generation who by and large don't don't have college degrees. They are the wealthiest generation. Um, they could not have college degrees because of their wealth. Yeah. Like, and so when you say like, oh, you know, if you forgive the 40% of the U.S. population that has uh, student loans against the 60% that don't, I'm like, well, over half of that six, well over half of that 60% that don't, it's over 65 um, and structurally way better off than the other half and also um it means more to some poor people like if i if i make twenty thousand dollars a year and let's say i only have 10k of student loans 
um, for an associate's degree, which is actually probably the average, right? Um, forgiving that, and like, and none of this is communism. I'm just speaking in terms of like milk toast social democratic reforms. Um, forgiving that would actually make a big difference to my life, uh, even though you're technically giving more money to someone who makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. Like it's this inability to look at math and proportions and relations to other people that I think is totally deceptively used here. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's funny to think about all that and like, see these arguments come up over and over and over again. Now I do admit that it is weird to me that the only thing I can see sock Dems, like I've, I work for a socialist publisher about every week. I get a book that's like, we need to forgive student loan debt and have Medicare for all. And then a green new deal. And I'm like, you know, there are other policies you have to deal with. Like yeah. ending credentialing regimes. Um, I, and this is just as ref, as a mild reformist package. Your, your reformist package is like really bonkers. Um, yeah. one huge, I mean, going back to like that, uh, the funny, why it was funny that like, uh, Lou like cited like the AMA and professional credentialing as, you know, parts of part of the good things for the working class. Like that's one of the biggest things that keeps immigrants poor. Like if we just recognize medical degrees from other countries, uh, that would be like huge already and like help, you know, the supply of, uh, doctors, but there's a reason we don't do that. And there's a reason there aren't many calls to do that, even from like the progressive parts of the PMC. Um, yeah, I know it's it's uh, it's I actually you know knowing knowing how how it's reversed too, right? Like we participate, like I don't know that that does get complicated because you get brain drain issues like in tech, but um, it is interesting to me how that is a core issue, like a core capital issue, because but if you get your, your medical license in the United States, Mexico, I know for a fact, because I had an American credential doctor when I was in Mexico, when I was dying of typhoid, um, they totally recognize our medical degree. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, their, their doctors are, are great. And if we, ha you know, like if you were to, yeah, it would reduce, it would reduce that credentialing power. Right. Um, I mean, licensure regimes are weird like that. And it's hard to get unions to care about alternative license teachers, even though, you know, I say this in a, in a teacher's union, even though by not doing so, we're actually dooming ourselves to further and further irrelevance. Like, but it's like, well, we have a special, you know, it is the, it, you do see a tendency of when social unionizing declines, um, for these unions, even business unions, to get really, really guilty, like, um, yeah. Well, yeah, but yeah, moving towards industrial unionism, you're moving towards like you know circling the wagons and just trying to protect whatever shrinking pie there is for your own members. Yeah, yeah, and 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 there's no way to get industrial unionism from like the early 20th century to work in the same way now. Right. I mean, like structurally. I keep on drawing this up when people are like, well, you know, the big thing was like what happened in Bama, excuse me, Alabama. Sorry, my Southern's coming back again. Um, what happened in Alabama a few weeks ago, like people, you know, one, somehow it's treated as a conspiracy and two, the left, like I was talking to JG Michaels about this and he was talking to people who were actually on the ground. He was like, yeah, the left did a social media campaign to support it, but they didn't actually go and talk to the workers in Alabama all that much. And I was like, and you know who did? Amazon. <laughs> I was like, and let's be honest, Amazon's not lying to them. They can totally close that shop in an area where there's no job that pays anything like $15 an hour. Um, unless you unionize all, right. all the Amazon warehouses at one time. And there's no easy way to do that. Like, um, yeah. I wanted to, can we talk about transgression a bit? Because this is something that kept coming up in the book. And, oh, yeah. Uh, that, that, the transgression and the Sokol hoax thing, that, that made me laugh. But, yes, yeah, so let's talk about transgression. It came up yesterday, too. 
So, because this is kind of inherited from Nagel, and I know you're, I don't know if you're under a gag order, but i like, no, this is what. This I'm not is, under a gag order. I just, this is told not to be too hard. Because, like, um, there's an illusion there, there where, okay, let me try to reconstruct this, right? So, Nagel wrote Kill All Normies, and, um, which I thought was good, by the way. Uh, but, yeah, so there was, you know, it was a, uh, it was like a sociology of the alt right, yeah, at, oh, or the emerging alt right at the time, right. And the conclusion seemed to be like retransgression, uh, and you know that was like uh, she had a accompanying Baffler article that I thought was also very good, um, that the mistake of like the new left uh, was to think that transgression was an inherently progressive force, right. That destruction of norms and transgression was inherently progressive. Where, well, now look, the, like the right wing has taken it and built a whole culture around it, and it's actually re it tra actually transgression can be channeled for totally reactionary ends, right? And so that was kind of like the critique. And Lou picks up that critique and runs with it, but she seems to run into contradiction because now what we're critiquing about the PMC, it's weird to both claim that the PMC uh, value transgression. And also that they're prudish, moralistic, uh, you know, policers of language and whatever, which they are. So, and, and you know, there's there's a there's parts in here where um, I think it is where, where Lou is talking about Nagel's book, um, and then you know, talking about another journalist that had like uh, covered the alt right and was like, uh, and almost like canceling that journalist for having like made be, been friendly with figures who later turned out to be all right or like weave or whatever um mm -hmm. so there there seems to be an inconsistency here right like are the pmc too in love with transgression or are they too moralistic uh prudish and like you know policing and yeah like you can't because you can't be both and in fact like the and like the contradiction comes at the end like where uh Luke calls for says we must detach ourselves uh, while the PMC promotes the hoarding of capital and virtue we must detach ourselves from its crypto pur puritanical regulation of human appetites and human relations we must be heretics we should blaspheme like so in other words we should transgress right right but yeah um, i think that that incoherence comes from the fact that you're trying to have your culture or cake and eat it too that it's not, you're trying to say there's something wrong with transgression, ipso facto transgression. And I will say that anything that is solely defined as counter signaling and that it's its only goal is reactive. And I say reactive, not reactionary, because people get those two confused. Um, but it is reactive. It has no positive politics. And it'll be dominated by, the, by whatever the cultural trends are that already exist, right? Um, I think Nagel was kind of half on to that. Um, there's a bunch of my. I will say this about the Nagel book. When I I was the I was the most reluctant vote on the Nagel book, which I did not see all of when I published it. I've read it twice now. I need to read it again. Um, see, I published it like it was me alone. There's three of us who voted on it. Um, but I actually wrote about five paragraphs of caveats to that book because Nagel did not know American culture very well, and that was clear, actually, even though she knew American online culture very well from her study in England. I mean, she was born in Texas, but she has not lived here most of her life, as far as I can tell. Um, she, uh, she did not take the prior existence of right-wing critics of the right and, and uh, um, third and fourth-way culture on the internet as as a distinct and active membership from the, er, from the early 2000s that had nothing to do with alt-right trolling mm -hmm. as a thing. She didn't really look at how they were able to manipulate that transgression specifically for certain ends because she didn't know enough about their history policy. The fact they have like, like national policy institutes, like close to where I live. And that's like what Richard Spencer controlled before when he founded the alt, like, the alt-right website, these people came out of a media apparatus and they had not, they didn't have a lot of money. Like, I don't want to make sense. Like they don't have like David Brooks money or anything like that. They did not, but they did have institutions and, and whatnot yeah. that, that were actively trying to court this transgression. Um, so 
what's the issue? Well, the issue seems to be literally, I mean, honestly, the, the part that's not said is like quit caring so much about the sexuality stuff. Um, that's transgressive to normies, but you're policing it. And, and I, I think that's disingenuous in a lot of ways. Like one that is to me, like when you look at like the, like you look at like the stats on trans employment, uh, versus trans representation in the media outside of the media, outside of a very narrow section of the left wing media sphere being trans, like dooms you your employment aspects. Like it really, really does. Even now, even with like more inclusive bathroom rules and public schools or whatever, like it's still really hard unless you are not clearly. Um, well, it's every it's like with every like minority or oppressed group like they the sort of like measures that get put in place mostly benefit like the middle class like you know even like affirmative action and stuff like that helps like a certain the, the talented tenth let's say right that helps the middle class people but like the the majority of like the working poor who are either black or trans or whatever like do not really see those benefits like at all yeah it's actually one of the things where i i i i do think that like adolf reed's point on this are far better better than nagel's or lou's where like they're they're like yes these these individuated separatized groups in the capital also have their own hierarchies which take advantage of these other cultural hierarchies but aren't bringing everybody else up with them yeah. and like that's real and that we need to deal with i mean and i do think like i'll, I'll you know my my example, this used to be before the last round of riots, what happened with BLM went from a loose movement that was responding to um, police brutality instances in the, in the deindustrial Midwest to formal um, charitable institutions and around colleges at every major cities with professionals like that. You actually saw a big shift in the focus from police brutality to language. Like it was, and to like diversifying the FBI, I, I, I sat through a, a speech about this once, like by a leader of Black Lives Matter who was calling for like diversification of the FBI, and I was like, I, you, well, every stat I have actually says that a lot of the police departments that are the worst to black people are like majority minority. Ferguson was actually the weird exception. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, um, I mean, it's it's no like it's the numbers are there. Like black cops shoot just as many black people as white cops do. Like it's right. It's the difference between right. structural and personal racism, frankly. But like, right. like we we there's all these bait and switches on the left. Um, I think there is a there is an institution. You do have to look at the way class restratifies amongst. Um, uh, minority groups, but I also think like the trans the transgression issue. There is a sense in which yes, the left in the seventies, in particular, got addicted to transgression for its own sake, and then it became reactionary in the seventies, in particular, yeah. like. Um, and I think there is like a, I think among the modern like pmc let's say there there is sort of a disingenuous in terms of like they they like they're still inflected with that kind of like residue of like the new left uh Maoism or whatever and they they do they are very reluctant to admit that what they are promoting is a new set of norms and moral norms uh because you know they they do have all these rules but they claim that they're actually dismantling um structures and then when you're when you're like well okay but you're and it's not even like saying okay you're, well your rules are bad it's just like admit that you're imposing like new norms and rules and it's like no it's just being a decent human being or like no it's transgression but you have to for true transgression you have to be punching up instead of punching down and all these like really like mealy mouth like it's like yeah but on. punching up punching up and down is always interesting as if people were monolithically up and down like or, or like what are the criteria that you're determining up and down right and like it's 
it, do, it does feel like shitting on like 20k shit kicker 20k a year shit kickers who who uh like country music and live in the sticks is not the right people to hit hit down on and interestingly enough most of the stats is just like with most people of color most of those people don't vote they're yeah. not part of this whole thing anyway and so like the, the, w there's this weird conflation there is a, a kind of like cultural capital that i think liberals used to hoard over like the dumb white masses without realizing the dumb white masses didn't vote right just like the unnamed they weren't going to say this but all the people of color who they were supposedly protecting also didn't vote um now we have more people voting than ever uh um you know that's true because i guess we've got people to believe that that matters but it's also interesting how like this still seems divorced from the life of most people. Like when I, when I go and talk to like my family, they don't know much about this or if they do know it, it's only because they hear about the media and they just roll their eyes and consider it's a bunch of like rich on rich violence. Like, you know, like that's the way they think about it. Um, so, so yeah, the transgression issue, though, I guess we've gone all over, all over the place. Like, transgression is almost always used to establish a new set of social norms like that's what you use it for um some of them are wild i mean uh your your wall the other day i, I literally <laughs> oh, oh God. Uh, about the, the the dsa polycule thing and i say this as a person who's like not i'm not you know I, I'm not an advocate of monogamy or non-monogamy. Um, I'm actually sort of these person who think most of this should be. Uh, I don't know. I'm I, I'm a libertarian on sexual issues. I will say that. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, I found that whole that whole thing like wild, like the way people were arguing, and I did come away well, feeling very like strong feelings on. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, and I, I can go all Freudian and say, like, of course you have very strong, strong <laughs> streams about polyamory for and against, because you have very strong streams about your own sexuality, your own sexual identity, and your continuing fear of terror and death. But, like, <laughs> but, like, at the same token, it doesn't matter that much one way or the other, like, at all. It is such a distraction from, like, everything else. Like, it, I guess, like, I think about Yasmin Ayers, like, your sex is not radical. And I'm like, yeah, it's agreed. It's also, like, so is your weird normie appeals to, like, norm burger sex. It, none, none of it matters very much. Yeah, like, like, once you're talking about trad as a thing, you've already, you, you're you already not, right? Because the whole point of, like, in fact, to me, the whole point of tradition is that it creates a set of norms that are just, like, in the air and it's it's like it's like when you ask a fish how's the water and they're like what's water like yeah. that's what tradition is as soon as you're like aware of the water and going around touting the benefits of water like, you're a counterculture yeah like you're already out of it um, like like and i don't mean i do know occasionally right wingers be like we're the real counterculture i'm like no you're one of many grow up like yeah. Yeah. like there's a billion countercultures bro um, <laughs> but, uh, none of them are particularly real and none of them are particularly fake. Like, it's just a thing. It's um, all, it's all simulacra now. Yeah. I mean, I, I do every now and then I go full Baldriard where I'm like, well, we've all lost and it's all fake and nothing matters. And, um, I don't really believe that, but there is, there is this way in which like, uh, um, I mean, you're aware of water when it's full of oil and CO2. <laughs> Fair. Um, but it's it's one of these things where, like, Demestra, uh, the reactionary makes this point, that, like, conservatism actually is an, as a, traditionalism, whatever, is actually a concession that you've already lost. Yeah, well, that's um, the difference between, I would say, between a reactionary and a conservative, right? Like, the reactionary knows that they've already lost, and they actually want to impose a new order, and the conservatives deluded about it. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I, oh, one thing I wanted to come back to, Rufi, when, when you asked, like, you know, okay, so what's the point of, like, what happens if you defeat the PMC? Um, which, like, Lou seems to want to do. And uh, I wonder if it's, like, some kind of plat, platypus-type thesis where, like, okay, the PMC is actually what's standing in the way of, like, an authentic worker left from emerging. So, like, before we even tackle capital, we have to destroy the PMC, destroy the existing cultural... Yeah, I th it, is, it does seem platypus-like, except that platypus would actually be more honest and say that this is an ideological battle, not a class one. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, I don't want to give Chris Catron credit for much. But he would not like. He actually, I don't see them tout. They haven't got on the PMC train, um, you know. Uh, and there is a point that that Katron makes that isn't wrong, and that any any class movement would have a bunch of cult, highly conflicted cultural groups within it, both in terms of cultural values, ethnic lines, whatever, like that, like. You know it, that that is true, um, and those would have to be hashed out um, politically. Uh, um, and I think yes, they do think that the old left is a, a, vest, a an ideological vestiges that's regressive um, and stopping any ability to connect with you know to merge um, with the the working class. Um, but they would not see that as a as a class actively operating in their own interest to do so. It does seem like that's some of the thesis is. But the thing is with this PMC stuff, they're so vague because I know I know some of them will will say the quiet part loud and admit no. What they actually want is you to side up to a counter elite, which is probably these these Trumpian petite bourgeois people to like reshore jobs or whatever. And my, my I remember when I was talking to. Uh, Tom O'Brien from African America five years ago. And he was like, he was like scared of like Trumpy and MMT, you know, of Steve Bannon. And I was just like, look, bro, you don't have to worry about it. Cause it won't work. Like they can't do that. Like, like you can't just reshore all the jobs without there being such a backlash on the international market that we'd lose access to a lot of our needed components. And then we would be totally boned. Which is why there is a hard limit to how much, you know, like tariffing or whatever Trump could do. Trump could only, like, yes, Trump was passing tariffs and stuff, but Trump could only do it on areas that were kind of inessential to the American economy. Unfortunately, like agriculture, which ironically finished killing a lot of American mid, mid, middling agriculture, just like killed it dead. But um, this is something that it's not possible. Like... And that's that's what gets me. I, I, this is my same problem with Adam Curtis. It's like this whole like we made the world this way. We can just make it another way. And I'm like, you can't right. just make it another way. Yeah. Like you can it's change the world, world, but you gotta change the world in a much. It, it's not something you have total control over consciously yet. Yeah. Well, like, who is the we? Right. That's that's really the question. Right. Yeah, there is no we. Uh... Trump only succeeded in movie jobs from China. To Vietnam. It's probably true, actually. Um, although he didn't hurt China that much. Promise you that. Um, China's growth has been uh, slowing, but it's still triple what everyone else has. That said, it would be. It's in its, you know, heroic period of industrial development, and it's about to be a dominant power, and it's going to have the same cycle as everyone else because China's not immune to the business cycle because it's still capitalist. Shh, don't tell some people. They get mad when you say that too loud. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so what does this mean for us? I don't know. I mean. I do think there's also an interesting, someone made an interesting argument that the PMC isn't a class in itself, but it is a class for itself that, and I'm like, what does that mean? It's like, it's not a sociological class or a Marxian class, but it like, it is a section that acts as if it has a coherent class interest. And I'm like, hmm, if you mean the people that we're talking about, like HR, I agree with you. 
if you mean anyone with a credential, you're crazy. Like, um, so yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on Heinrich Grossman? <laughs> Do not have thoughts on Heinrich Grossman. Yeah, uh, uh, Heinrich Grossman is a person who worked out the equations for the tendency of where to profit the fall the most clearly. So um, okay, I I yeah like. It was like when I was a philosophy major, and then I get to the parts with like the actual like equations. The numbers. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah. Alas, um, yeah. I, mean, I remember watching some. Uh, I remember going to a lecture of uh, Andrew Kleiman, uh, who had like supposedly solved the temporal problem or something. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. He he solved the temporal single. So he he uh, came up with an interpretation called. Um, temporal single systems interpretation of Marx, which did, which removes the equilibrium assumption. The equilibrium assumption makes it to where you don't need declining rates of profit. It's actually, it's not logically necessary. And that's actually true. Um, the problem is even normal economists will now tell you the equilibrium assumption is based off conditions that never actually exist in the economy ever, ever. So it's 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 a hypothetical model that you can find no empirical backing of equilibrium working that way. Um, and then when you do that and put time back in, it starts the tendency of the rate of profit dec declines. That actually wasn't what Kleiman was trying to fix. He was trying to fix uh, the um, the transformation problem, um, but it it fixes a bunch of them. It's right. kind of a shame that Kleiman's you know, an asshole. Yeah. Um, and I'll say that on air. Uh, I don't care. He called me a McCarthyist in print. So, <laughs> um, but, yes. but uh, I, I do think Grossman, Grossman is right about that. My problem with Grossman is Grossman thought that it would mean that eventually the workers would have to rise up. And I just, I'm like, no, they don't have to. <laughs> they can totally not do it. No. Like, Well, that's, that's what I find interesting. Right. Cause like, um, I mean, am I reading like, you know, the the West had its period of like progressive capitalism, right? And the workers didn't rise up. And now we're like in a decline period, right? Where like the capitalism is like reverting to some kind of, you know, our capitalism is reverting to some kind of neo feudal thing. And like worker organization is just like at an, I mean, despite the recent upticks, like on the, long scale it's at an all-time low uh and then i guess the question is like okay is it like now is it like china gets a turn and they have an opportunity and then once they uh once their growth starts to slow some of the cracks will start to emerge and maybe yeah their growth has been slowing for a decade actually like it, right. it's it they handle covid way better than everybody else and their growth is still at like six percent Right. But, but that's, still, that's still like pretty big compared to yeah that, that's triple what we have we're like two to three at best however what i'm going to say is at the same period of our development we were you know when we were emerging right. the world market we were at about six percent and i remember 10 years ago all the like china neoliberal wonks were like oh when they hit eight percent they'll fall apart and i'm like no they won't that no. they're just following the same thing that we did like <laughs> But what I what I doubt is there's a lot of people on the kind of social democratic left who are weirdly soft on China issues because of their currency manipulation, actually, um, who think that China will not go will be able to avert the business cycle. But I can tell you, looking at the numbers, they have recessions now on a business cycle like we do. It's not as bad. They don't go into like negative profitability, but they have the cycle. And that means they're operating like a capitalist country and they're going to follow similar trends. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with Adam Curtis, actually, it's one of the few things I agree with him on, that the Chinese system is thus older than we think it is because, like, in its way, in way it's approaching this, because it also has the benefit of accumulated technical gain, like America did compared to Britain, like, except it has a whole world to the 1980s you know, to, to plug into. So it's got a lot of low hanging fruit. That's going to end. In fact, it's ending now. Um, 
So it's caught up to the rest of the world. It hasn't surpassed it, but it's caught up to the rest of the world. Well, what happened when Japan and Korea did that? What happened when China did that? Like it's right. you hit a wall and you start your business cycle starts kicking in. And what I worry about for the world is what that has what that has traditionally led to is increased aggressiveness with other nations. And you've seen that with China. You've seen an increased uh, uh, a bellicoseness to the U.S. that uh, is related to their increase in power, but also seems to be related to the fact that they now have more normal um, developmental patterns to the rest of the world and a hostility with with with, um, with India and a sub hostility, a kind of underlying like frenemy relationship with russia that that does complicate things that's why stuff like BRICS fell apart like and you're going to see more and more of that um because china is acting more and more like a fully developed capitalist hegemon but it's going to have the same problems that a capitalist hegemon does like low hanging fruit goes away yeah. um and i unlike a lot of my mmt or friends do not think currency manipulation can get you out of this like I think they have point. Like I do think they have points about ways we could better handle transitions and stuff. I do. Like I don't. I I, I don't want to sound like I'm like I used to think MMTers were the worst thing in the world, and now I like them better than social democrats. But, um, I think there are real problems there. I'll also, say my my worry about a lot of the policy fixes you see from both the uh, the um, the anti PMC people who want our 1950s back and the MMTers is a lot of what they would actually do as policy props up one section of the rentier class over another. Um, whether it's like basically artificially generating industrial development or basically creating like huge amounts of paper assets to increase the buying of property and um, thus rentier relations, literally. Um, both of those things are common. This is why, like, there, there's a there's a focus on an MMT that pe the MMT are say is progressive, like it's a tendency of the of the interest rate to be zero. Well, that means that paper assets accumulation of uh, of rents is really easy, like really easy. Um. So thoughts yeah, on, thoughts on fundamental principles of communist distribution and production. Um, I like. Uh, can you be more specific? That's John Appel's group. It's a, it's it's a council communist thing. Um, I would say I, I think people need to quit asking everybody who comes up to this is very um, very important but largely forgotten left communist text. Uh, I think it's I think it's interesting. I haven't worked through all the problems with it. Uh, econophysics is bad. Okay. <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh, German Empire had a had a had the same development strategy. It just oh yeah, you're right about that, Nico. Actually, I do think the econophysics answers to equilibrium is interestingly more honest than marginalist answer to equilibrium. Um, but now we're alienating our viewers, and I can totally see it in our numbers. Thank you for your time, Alex. Do you have anything you want to plug, say, do? Um, uh, um no, I'm I'm good for now. Uh, I'll I'm. Trying to work on a new thing pretty soon. I guess I should follow up that uh, that American Affairs article at some point. But, Aren't you? Yeah, uh, yeah on incel them and the weird, <laughs> the yeah. weird uh, trad. Yeah. What's it? Trad. That. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting. I thought your article on that was was interesting about about sexual breakdown and how people aren't dealing with the economic implications of it at all. Um, interestingly enough, the only other person I've ever heard talk about it in that way is a kind of hyper, you know, liberal feminist, Hannah Rosen, who mentioned that like, it was, in yeah, our, yeah, the end of men. Yeah. Which I always thought the end of men was funny. Cause I was like, cause she was like, the end of men comes from, from a, you know, a particular recession. It's not actually that women were, were doing better. It's that men were doing worse. And I was like, yeah, and it just takes a different kind of recession to kill that. And guess what we just saw? Right. Um, <laughs> that exact kind of recession that hit um, services harder than it hit production. Um, so, I mean, I don't say that with glee. It's just like, don't never assume the, the conditions that are created by one very brief economic situation will be perpetually true. Um, if anything, if we learn anything from the 20th century is like, 
Marxists were always trying to project X that was happening right then forever. And uh, it never goes well. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so you were working on something. Is it going to be a book? Maybe? Uh, maybe. There's been talk of that, but uh, not, I don't have anything uh, to announce yet. All right. So a bunch of articles coming out on on uh and sell them <laughs> um uh, diversify my uh <laughs> yeah. um and alex is uh, are you are you still doing any media production or anything yeah i'm still doing stuff for uh like non-political stuff for ted ed and this like this like this app in london um but yeah the, just you know pmc stuff yeah totally pmc stuff yeah, you, you got it. You 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 live in the heart of the PMC beast. So yeah, uh, I know I can't go outside without meeting running into like three different podcasters. Um, is that true about New York? Like, it is actually true that one time I just randomly went out to Mars around my house and I ran into two different people from Brooklyn left podcasts at two different bars. Um, wow. You yeah. know, as a person who's been doing left podcasts since 2011, that's really hard for me to imagine. But, but I believe it because every time I look in the political podcast, they're all lefty and they're all kind of from a tiny milieu. And I'm like, how do we have we have, how do we have this much to say <laughs> about, about this? Like, is like is this how this is how we handled uh, the economic crisis? We all became podcasters. It actually, interestingly, almost leads me to just want to like put my stuff up and be like, I'm done. You guys, you youngins can go do this and not matter the way I have not mattered for oh, oh, yeah. a decade. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Alex. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm glad to have you. Yeah.